Okay, now we're going to go on and look at the interventions or the nursing implications for somebody with cirrhosis, severe cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease. And we're going to take a look at the three most serious implications of cirrhosis, the things that prompt hospitalization for these patients. So looking at esophageal varices, beta blocker therapy is used. Non-selective beta blocker indrol is going to decrease heart rate, thereby decreasing pressures in the portal circulation. There's also vasopress vasopressin as an approach, which we know is a vasopressor drug, and it will shunt those vessels that feed into those bulging, bleeding esophageal vessels. The only problem with vasopressin is that it does um, also vasoconstrict coronary vessels. So if you have an underlying coronary heart disease, those patients are not good candidates for this. It could also vasopress vessels in the mesenteric bed, so the ones in the abdominal region, and that could cause ischemic episodes as well. So that has to be delivered with caution. Also remember, vasopressin is a form of antidiuretic hormone, so infusions of vasopressin can have an antidiuretic effect. So your sodium needs to be looked at, otherwise it will go into that dilutional hyponatremia that we looked at when we looked at SIADH. So that's an that's a, um, implication that needs to be looked at. There is something called octiotride, or also called sandostatin. Sandostatin will also provide some vasopressor effect to the vessels that feed those gastric vessels, except it won't affect blood pressure like vasopressin will. So it's a pretty popular alternative. Uh, they're not exactly sure why it does this. It's kind of an off-label use, but it does do the trick. Esophageal gastric balloon, that is saved for patients with refractory esophageal vessels that are bleeding. In other words, it just won't stop it. It's um, a Band-Aid approach. It will provide a tamponade to those uh, lower esophageal vessels. The only problem with this this gastric balloon that is inflated in the esophagus and also in the stomach is that you risk migration of that balloon upward and so it becomes a risk for airway closure. They may uh, opt to intubate those patients so the airway is protected. Certainly it's been a nursing school rule for years and years to have a scissor at the bedside so that you're able to just cut it and remove it in case there is migration of that esophageal balloon into the airway. Certainly patients that are confused, and we're gonna talk about the effects of hepatic encephalopathy, also run the risk of kind of pulling on the tube. There's also the risk of aspiration. So this esophageal gastric balloon is not without risk, and it's not used that often, but it's, it's still available. The uh, time that you're supposed to leave it in is not very long. It's just for those bleeding vessels just to bright provide like a temporary uh, tamponade, so maybe up to 12 hours. TIPS procedure, also called transhepatic intraheportal systemic shunting procedure, is just that. It's a shunt that is placed that goes from the portal vein into the hepatic vein and bypasses the liver completely. So it's great because it definitely decreases pressures in that portal system, but you also run the risk of hepatic encephalopathy getting worse, and certainly all the toxins from that portal circulation just going right into the central circulation. So it is also kind of a stopgap measure for those patients that have this refractory bleeding esophageal varices. There's also endoscopic variceal ligation, which is really just um, almost like a rubber band that you apply to those bleeding vessels. So they eventually necrose and slough off. Endoscopic sclerotherapy is applying a sclerosing agent to those bleeding vessels, and the sclerosing agent just uh, renders that tissue non-functional anymore. So certainly it's going to necrose that area of the tissue so they're not bleeding anymore. Okay, so let's talk about approaches for hepatic encephalopathy. So as we remember, hepatic encephalopathy is secondary to this byproduct of protein degradation that occurs as a result of normal flora acting on 
protein in the gut that we eat, or in the case of bleeding varices, the blood is a protein that's metabolized as such, so that could make hepatic encephalopathy worse. So this byproduct of protein degradation is NH3 or ammonia. So the goal is to reduce ammonia formation. Certainly having a low protein diet is one of the implications for care. However, only patients that are suffering from hepatic encephalopathy need to have a low protein diet. You should not back off on protein for patients in liver failure unless they have hepatic encephalopathy because we need protein for growth and repair and certainly for organ repair if we have a debilitated organ. So protein is an important um, component of our diet. Lactulose is kind of a cathartic, it's a laxative and so it will purge the gut of all that stool which is the source of this ammonia formation. So lactulose also mag citrate which also serves the same purpose but it's a different type of um, cathartic for the bowel, but both of these will purge the bowel. You want to look for two to three soft stools a day, otherwise you're going to induce you know, diarrhea and fluid and electrolyte imbalances for this patient. Remember, the therapeutic effect needs to be a lowered ammonia formation, and we want to get there in the most physiologic way, not in a way where we're causing more imbalances from giving too much of a uh, bowel purge. Something called neomycin sulfate is an antibiotic, but it's a special kind of antibiotic. It's an antibiotic that stays in the gut, sterilizes the gut, is how I learned it back in the day. So in sterilizing the gut, you're killing off that normal flora bacteria there, so protein degradation can't take place. All right, so ascites, let's talk about what we do of all this fluid, sometimes liters of fluid that the patient has in their peritoneal cavity. Now, we talked about the fact that this could cause, you know, dyspnea. This is a lot of work to try to move air when there's liters and liters of fluid sitting on your diaphragm. So the most conservative approach is to just put the patient on a low sodium diet. So now we have a low protein if hepatic encephalopathy exists in addition to low sodium diet. Uh, the other independent action is just to elevate the head of the bed so that the patient has less weight on their diaphragm. Also a paracentesis will uh, enable the practitioner to remove via a needle guided by ultrasound into the peritoneal space and remove all that nice protein rich fluid and i'm saying it's nice protein rich fluid because remember you know all these things are not done without risk and without sacrifice so you're removing all this albumin and electrolytes and fluid that used to be part of this patient's system so you know, make sure that you don't have cardiovascular compromise and drops in blood pressure as a result of the weight that's shifting and, you know, hemodynamic instability and certainly document the amount that's removed. Now, there is something called a peritonovenous shunt, which is used in extreme cases, which actually solves that problem of kind of throwing away that uh, acidic fluid accumulation because what this shunt does is it allows the redistribution of that peritoneal fluid back into the central circulation. So it's surgically guided from the inferior vena cava subcutaneously and allowed to sit in that peritoneal space. And so when the patient takes a deep breath in and has that increase in intrathoracic pressure, the fluid is able to migrate upward and a valve does not allow it to go backward. So fluid is just being redirected upward and back into the right atrium. So complications, well, if you don't at least remove some of it, depending on how much has been accumulated, you could cause a real pretty severe fluid volume overload. It's just too many liters of fluid kind of occurring into the central circulation very quickly. Also, of course, with both of these procedures, you have to worry about bacterial peritonitis, which you have to worry about anyway with ascites, except not spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, like if we didn't go there, but certainly we're introducing bacteria when you're introducing a needle into the peritoneal space. 
Diuretic therapy is also going to be part of care. Loop diuretics with Lasix. Remember, we always have to think about circulatory compromise and imbalances in fluid and electrolytes, notably potassium with the loop diuretic. And then there is aldactone or, or spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. So I guess they can balance themselves out. You still need to look at those potassium levels closely. I think it's important to, to point out that aldactone is an aldosterone antagonist diuretic. So that is the mechanism of action. And certainly that's a great choice for this patient because we talked about how when you're in liver failure, you're unable to inactivate those circulating hormones like aldosterone. So when you're giving an aldosterone antagonist, that's going to address that directly. So it's a great choice. It's also maybe a little more conservative in its diuretic effects than Lasix is. Taking a look at the labs that are abnormal, I know it's part of assessment, but it's also an intervention is to track those labs and track the results of the interventions we do. Um, total bilirubin, so the patient is going to have hyperbilirubinemia and they're going to display that jaundice and the very dark urine and the clay colored stools like we talked about. But we want to see what those levels look like. We're going to look at the total bilirubin. We're going to look at both the unconjugated and the conjugated bilirubin. Because remember, when there's nodules and you know various parts of the liver are, are working and some parts aren't, you're going to have elevated both with the unconjugated being absorbed into the circulation because it never gets there and gets conjugated. And with the and the conjugated form of bilirubin being elevated because of ducts that are blocks, albumin is going to be diminished, hypoalbuminemia, because remember the liver manufactures it, and certainly we're going to take a look at the effects on that third space or the extravascular fluid that is going to be able to now shift into the tissues. Elevated PTINR, we're going to check out because of those prothrombin or the plasma protein prothrombin level being diminished. Elevated AST and ALT or SGOT, SGPT is another name of it, and I'm not going to say the whole long, but those are a measure of liver dysfunction. I know we call them the liver function tests, and they are, but it really shows you how much kind of assault, how much dysfunction is occurring acutely in the liver. So it's good to see if those have spiked up because kind of ironically, when you have no liver function at all, if you have end-stage liver disease, these values are actually going to be diminished ultimately. So we want to see what they are at a snapshot in time.